In a few hours I land at Foxani in northern Romania. My squadron is now stationed at Husi a little further north. The front is holding much more firmly than it did a fortnight ago. It runs from the Prut to the Dinister along the edge of the plateau north of Iasi. The small town of Husi nestles between the hills. On some of them grow extensive vineyards. Will we be able to wait for the wine? The airfield is on the northern edge of the town. And since our houses are on the opposite side, we have to walk through its streets every morning. The population watches our actions with interest. When you talk to them, they always show their friendliness. The representatives of the church are in particularly close contact with us. They are led by a bishop whom I often visit. He never ceases to explain to me that the clergy see in our victory the only chance to preserve religious freedom and independence. There are many merchants in the city. There are a huge number of small shops. It is all very different from the Soviet Russia we left so recently. Its middle class has disappeared, swallowed up by the proletarian Moloch. As I walk through the city I am particularly struck by the sheer number of dogs. By all accounts they are homeless. They wander everywhere, you meet them on every corner and in every square. I am temporarily accommodated in a small villa with a vineyard, with a small stream running along the side where you can swim. At night, whole processions of dogs pass through this vineyard. They move in Indian formation, in packs of twenty or thirty. One morning I am still lying in bed when a huge mongrel dog peeps in at my window and puts its front paws on the sill. Behind her, fifteen of her colleagues stand in the same pose. The rear ones have put their feet on the backs of those in front and are all staring into my room. When I chase them away, they sneak away sadly and without barking to continue their incessant trotting. Food is plentiful. We live well, for we receive our salary in lie. And though there is nothing much to buy with it, at least we can always buy eggs. Gradually almost all of our salary starts to be spent on buying eggs. Among the officers, Lieutenant Stahler holds the first place in the consumption of eggs. He eats an enormous quantity of them. One day, when fuel shortages prevent us from flying, a test of this new source of energy begins immediately. The whole squadron down to the last man engages in physical exercise, usually cross-country running, gymnastics, and, of course, football. I am still unable to take part in these exercises as the soles of my feet are not quite through yet and my shoulder hurts if I move my arm recklessly. But for the squadron as a whole, these sporting exercises are a splendid recreation. Some, and I am in the forefront, take the opportunity and walk in the mountain forests or practice other sports. We usually go to the aerodrome between four and five o'clock in the morning. At the far edge of the town we always come across a huge herd of sheep, with a donkey marching ahead of them. His eyes are completely covered by a long tangled mane, and we wonder how he can see us at all. Because of that mane we nicknamed him Eclipse. One morning as we whiz by we tug on the tip of his tail. This produces a series of reactions. First he kicks up his hooves like a kicking horse. Then, remembering his donkey nature, he freezes, and finally his chicken heart gives out and he takes off like the wind. We are flying sorties into a relatively stable sector where, nevertheless, the constant arrival of reinforcements indicates that the Reds are preparing to strike into the heart of Romania. Our area of operations stretches from the village of Targul Frumos in the west to the bridgeheads on the Dionista and to Tiraspol in the southeast. We make most of our sorties to the area north of Iasi. Here the Soviets are trying to dislodge us from the hills around Karbati on the bank of the Prut. Fierce fighting in this sector is fought around the ruins of Stantsa Castle on the so-called Castle Hill. Time after time we lose this position but we always regain it. 
In this zone, the Soviets are constantly bringing their huge reserves to bear. How often we have to attack the bridges over the river. Our route takes us across the Prut to the Dinesta beyond Kishinev and further east. We will remember these names for a long time Kozika, Grigoriopol, the bridgehead at Buta. For a short time we stand on the same aerodrome with fighters from JG-52. They are commanded by Major Barkhorn, who knows his job from a Tazi. They often accompany us on combat sorties, and we give them a lot of trouble, because the new Yak-3, which has just appeared on the other side, puts on a new show every day. The group's forward air base is in Ayasi. From here it is easier to patrol over the front line. The group commander is often at the front line to observe the interaction between the aircraft and the ground troops. His forward post is equipped with a radio station that allows him to listen to all conversations in the air and on the ground. The fighter pilots talk to each other, the fighters talk to the ground control officer, the Stukas talk to each other and to the liaison officer on the ground. However, we usually all use different frequencies. A little anecdote that the 8th Group commander tells us on his last visit shows his concern for his sheep. He saw our squadron approaching Yassam. We are heading north. Our mission is to attack targets in the castle area that the army wanted to neutralize by liaising with our dispatcher. Over Yassis we are met not by our fighters but by a strong La formation. In a second the sky is filled with maneuvering aircraft. The slow Stukas can't cope with the arrow like Russian fighters, especially with a full load of bombs. The group commander watches the battle with mixed feelings and hears all the negotiations. The seventh squadron commander, assuming I didn't see the La Fives coming in behind me, shouts Hannah Laura, look round, one of them is going to shoot you down. I have long since spotted the fighter, but I still have plenty of time to make an evasive manoeuvre. I don't like this shouting over the radio telephone. It discourages the crews and adversely affects their marksmanship. So I reply, I haven't been born yet, who will shoot me down? I'm not bragging. I only want to demonstrate a certain impartiality for the benefit of other pilots, because equanimity in a place like this is contagious. The Commodore concludes this story with a wide grin. When I heard that, I was no longer worried about you or the entire squadron. In fact, I watched this mess with great amazement. How often, when instructing the crews, I gave them this lecture, anyone who fails to stay close to me will be shot down by a fighter. Anyone who lags behind will be easy prey and will not be able to count on any help. So stay as close to me as possible. Getting hit by an anti-aircraft gun is most often a fluke. If you are unlucky, you are just as likely to be hit on the head by a slate falling off a roof or hit by a tram. Besides, war is not life insurance. The old-timers already know my point of view and winged sayings. When newcomers are brought up to speed, Veterans hide a smile and say, he may be right about that the fact that we suffer virtually no losses during encounters with enemy fighters supports my theory. The new recruits must, of course, receive some training before they even get to the front. Otherwise, they will be a danger to their colleagues. Here, for example, just a few days later we make a sortie in the same area and we are again attacked by large forces of enemy fighters. Lieutenant Raim, who has recently joined us, dives after the leader and cuts off his tail with his propeller. Fortunately, the wind carries their parachutes to our trenches. We descend in a spiral around them until they reach the ground, because Soviet fighters regularly open fire on our crews who parachute out. After a few months, Rem has developed into a first-class pilot, becoming a lead pilot himself and often filling in for the link commander. I have a sense of sympathy for those who are slow learners. Lieutenant Schwerblatt is less fortunate. He has already made 700 combat missions and was awarded the Knight's Cross. 
After receiving a direct hit over the target, he had to make a forced landing just behind our trenches, lost his left leg and several fingers on his hand. We will be destined to fight together during the final stage of the war. We have not a moment's respite, not only in the area north of Yass, but also in the east, where the Russians have captured bridgeheads on the banks of the Dniester. One day in the afternoon, three of our machines were flying over the Dniester bend between Kushitsa and Grigoriopol, where our defences had been broken through by a large number of T-34s. Lieutenant Fickle and a non-commissioned officer accompany me in a U-87 armed with bombs. An escort is supposed to be waiting for us, and as I approach the river bend, I can actually see low-flying fighters in the target area. Remaining optimistic, I conclude that they are their own. I am flying towards the target, looking for tanks, when I realize that these fighters are not my escort at all, but the Ivans. How stupid of us, as we had already broken formation when we started looking for individual targets. The other two planes are delayed in their approach and slowly begin to join me. Moreover, our luck is changing. The Ivans are ready to fight, a desire they don't get very often. The non-commissioned officer's aeroplane catches fire very quickly and turning into a torch, disappears in a westerly direction. Fickle informs me that he too has been hit and has to get away. The pilot of the La Five, who in all probability knows his business, gets on my tail, the others keep a short distance behind him. No matter what I do, I don't manage to shake this laugh. He has partially released the flaps to reduce his speed. I fly into deep gullies to keep him low and make the danger of colliding with the ground confuse his aim. But he keeps behind me and his tracers pass quite close to my cockpit. My gunner Gadaman shouts excitedly that the fighter is sure to shoot us down. The gully widens to the southeast of the river bend, and suddenly I'm making a turn with La clawing at my tail. Gadaman's machine gun is jammed. Tracers pass under the left wing. Gadaman yells higher, I reply, I can't. I've already got the handle in my stomach. The amazement begins to slowly build in me as to how this guy coming from behind can follow my turns in a fighter jet. Sweat is running down my forehead. I keep pulling on the control stick. The tracers continue to whiz by under my wing. Turning around, I can look directly into Ivan's tense, focused face. The other lays have stopped their pursuit, apparently expecting their colleague is about to shoot us down. Flying in this style is beyond them almost vertical turns at 10 to 15 meters above the ground. Suddenly, on top of an earthen fortification, I notice German soldiers. They are waving their hands like crazy, most likely unable to understand the situation. But here comes a loud cry from Gaderman La has fallen. Did Gaderman shoot down the enemy aircraft with his machine gun, or did the fighter spars fail to withstand the tremendous strain during those full-speed turns? In my headphones I can hear the loud shouts of the Russians. They saw what happened and it's out of the blue. I've lost Fickle and I'm flying home. Below me in the field lies a burning U-87. The non-commissioned officer and his flight gunner are standing next to it in full health, with German soldiers rushing towards them. So tomorrow they will be able to fly again. Shortly after landing I meet Fickle. There will be ample reason to celebrate our new birthday. Fickle and Gaderman also insist on celebrating. The next morning the ground adjuster of this sector calls and tells me how anxiously he watched yesterday's performance and heartily congratulates me on behalf of the division. It is clear from the radio message intercepted last night that the fighter pilot was a famous Soviet ace, twice hero of the Soviet Union. I must admit that he was a good pilot, which is no small thing. Shortly after this episode, I have to report to the Reichsmarschall on two different occasions. The first time I land at Nuremberg and go to his ancestral castle. 
When I enter the courtyard, I am surprised to see Goering dressed up in medieval Germanic hunting costume and in the company of the attending physician, shooting a bow at a brightly coloured target. He pays no attention to me until he has used up his entire supply of arrows. I'm surprised to see that he hasn't missed a single shot. I only hope he is not seized with the desire to show off his skill by making me compete with him, in which case he must realise that, because of the wound in my shoulder, I cannot hold a bow, much less shoot one. The fact that I report to him on my arrival in my undies in any case indicates my physical weakness. He tells me that he often exercises while on holiday, it is a way of keeping fit and his doctor willy-nilly must join him in this enjoyable pastime. After a modest dinner with the family, at which only General Lawser is present, I learn the reason for my summons. He awards me the pilot's gold medal with diamonds and asks me to form a squadron armed with the new Messerschmitt's 410 with 50 mm guns and take command of it. He hopes that with this type of aircraft we will be able to match the four-engined aircraft used by the enemy. I conclude that, since I have just been awarded diamonds, he wants to turn me into a fighter pilot. I am sure he is thinking in terms of the categories of the First World War, during which pilots awarded Paul Le Marit were usually fighter pilots like himself. He is predisposed to this branch of the Luftwaffe and those who belong to it, and would like to include me in that category. I tell him that I really wanted to become a fighter pilot earlier and what prevented it. But since those days I have gained valuable experience as a fighter pilot, and I would not want to change anything. I therefore ask him to drop the idea. He then tells me that he has the Führer's consent to this appointment, although he admits that he did not much like the idea of removing me from flying dive bombers. Nevertheless, the Führer agreed with him that I should on no account land behind Russian lines to rescue other crews any longer. That's an order. If crews are to be rescued, others must do so in the future. Such a requirement bothers me. Part of our code is the rule all those shot down will be rescued. I believe I should be in charge of rescuing them myself, because I, by virtue of my extensive experience, can do it more easily than anyone else. If it should be done at all, then I am the person who should carry it out. But to object now would be a waste of energy. At the critical moment, one must act as necessity dictates. Two days later, I return to Husi and take part in the combat operations. Taking advantage of a pause of a few days, I decide to make a short trip to Berlin for a conference that had been postponed all along. On my return, I land at Gorlitz, visit home and fly east to Warslow, near Vienna. Early in the morning, when I wake up at my friend's house, I learn that people from the Reichsmarschall's headquarters have been trying to find me all night. Having contacted him, I receive orders to proceed immediately to Berchtesgaden. Since I assume that this is another attempt to impose staff or some special duties on me, I ask him, is this good news or bad news he knows me well and says, of course it's good. It is not without a sense of disbelief that I board the plane and fly at low altitude along the Danube. The weather is the worst imaginable. Clouds hang at a height of 50 metres. Almost all airfields are closed. The Vienna forests are hidden by thick clouds. I fly up the Danube Valley from St. Polten to Amstetten and Salzburg, where I land. Here I am already being waited for and taken to the Reichsmarschall's hunting lodge near the Berghof in Obersalzburg. He is in a meeting with the Führer, and we are sitting at the table when he returns. His daughter Edda is quite a big girl. She is allowed to sit with us. After a short walk round the garden, the conversation takes on a formal character, and I can't wait to find out what's in the air this time. The house and garden are distinguished by genuinely good taste, nothing gaudy or posh. The family leads a simple, modest life. 
I receive a formal audience in a bright study with numerous windows, from which opens a majestic panorama of mountains glistening in the spring sunshine. Goring, no doubt, has a weakness for old customs and costumes. I simply do not know how to describe his attire. It is a kind of robe or toga, the kind worn by the ancient Romans, reddish-brown in colour, fastened with a gold brooch. This is all new to me. He smokes a long pipe, floor-length, with a painted porcelain cup at the end. I remember that my father had one just like it when I was a kid, at the time his pipe was longer than mine. After watching mine in silence for a bit, he begins to speak. I am summoned for a new honour. He pins the front service gold medal with diamonds on my chest to commemorate my 2,000 combat sorties. It's a brand new medal that no one has ever been awarded before because I alone have made that many sorties. It is made of solid gold, with a platinum wreath in the centre with crossed swords, underneath which is the number 2000, set with tiny diamonds. I'm glad this award doesn't come with any nasty extras like it used to. We then discuss the situation, and he opines that I should lose no time and return to base. I intend to do so anyway. He tells me that a large-scale offensive is being prepared in my sector and the signal to launch it will be given within a few days. He has just returned from a meeting with the Führer, where the whole situation was discussed down to the smallest detail. He expresses surprise that I did not notice these preparations on the spot, since approximately 300 tanks will be involved in this operation. I am now straining my hearing. The number 300 amazes me. It is fine for the Russian side, but so many tanks on our side? I reply that I can hardly believe it. I ask him if he could name these divisions and the number of tanks they have at their disposal, because I am perfectly well informed about most of the divisions in my sector and how many serviceable tanks there are in each of them. On the eve of my departure from the front I had a conversation with General Unrain, commander of the 14th Armoured Division. It was a fortnight ago, and he complained to me bitterly that he had only one tank left for the whole division, and even this vehicle could not be considered combat ready because he had ordered it to be equipped for ground control of air flights. This machine was of much greater value to him than a combat-ready tank, for having a good connection with the Stukas he could neutralise with the many targets which his tanks alone could not disable. I thus know absolutely exactly how many tanks are in the 14 armoured division. The Reichsmarschall finds it difficult to believe me, as he has an entirely different figure. He says to me half seriously, half jokingly, if I didn't know you, I would have you arrested for saying that. But we're about to find out he goes to the telephone and connects with the chief of the general staff. You have just informed the Führer that 300 tanks are earmarked for participation in Operation XI. Standing next to him can hear every word. Yes, that's right. I want to know the names of these divisions and how many tanks they have. I have one person here who is well acquainted with the situation. Who is it? asks the chief of the general staff. This is one of my men and he should know the chief of the general staff, unfortunately for him, started precisely with the 14th Panzer Division. He says that the division has 60 tanks. Goring can barely contain himself. My man says that the 14th has only one tank, there is a long silence on the other end of the line. When did he leave the front? Four days ago, silence again. And then, 40 tanks are in transit. The rest are in repair shops, but will certainly be in their units by the right date, so this figure is correct. He gives the same answer for all divisions. The Reichsmarschall hangs up the phone with rage. This is how things are done. 
The Führer is given a completely false picture that is based on incorrect data and is still surprised when the operation does not bring the success that was hoped for. Today, thanks to you, this case has been explained. But how often we have built our hopes on such utopias. The entire communications network in the southeastern zone is constantly being bombed by the enemy. Who knows how many tanks out of these 40, for example, will even reach the front and when exactly that will happen. Who knows whether the repair shops will be able to get spare parts in time, and if they do, will they complete the repairs in the allotted time? I must report everything to the Fuhrer immediately. He speaks with anger, then silence is established. When I return to the front, I am still mulling over what are what I have just heard. What is the purpose of this misleading and false reports? Is it done by accident or on purpose? Either way it plays into the hands of the enemy. Who and in what circles commits these sordid acts? I interrupt my journey by stopping at Belgrade, and as I am coming in for a landing at Semlinsky Aerodrome, a formation of American four-engine bombers appears overhead. As I step off the runway, I see the entire airfield staff scattering in different directions. To the west of the runway are hills in which underground tunnels have been dug to serve as shelters. I can see the formation exactly in front of me, a short distance from the airfield. It all doesn't look good. I run after the human descendant with as much speed as I can develop in my undies. I just manage to skid into the tunnel as a series of bombs explode on the airfield, raising a giant mushroom cloud of smoke. I can't believe how anything is able to survive. After a few minutes the smoke clears a little, and I make my way back to the airfield. Almost everything is destroyed. My trusty U-87 stands among the wreckage, riddled with shrapnel, but the engine is intact and the landing gear is in good order. Most of the controls are functioning normally. I look for a strip of land away from the runway that would be suitable for takeoff and am glad to be able to take to the air again. Dedicated and brave, my wounded machine carries me over the entire southeast zone and brings me down to the ground at Husey. During my absence, a Romanian U-87 formation has been attached to us. The crews consist mainly of officers, some of whom have some experience, but we soon discover that it is much better if they fly with us in the same formation. Otherwise, the number of their losses on each sortie remains at an all-time high. Especially they are pestered by enemy fighters, and it takes them very little time to realise, on the basis of their experience, that even in a low-speed aircraft it is not necessary to be shot down if one manages to keep in formation. The regimental staff move to the FV-190. Our first squadron is withdrawn from combat for eight weeks for rest and is based at the airfield at Soxic region. Here experienced pilots of U-87s are being retrained on single-seat aeroplanes. In the long run, all our units will have to do the same, as production of the U-87 will soon be discontinued. While we are stationed at Husey, in between flights I am practicing on HQFV 190s in order not to interrupt combat operations later. I finish my self-training with one or two combat sorties and feel quite safe in this aircraft. July has arrived and our sorties are becoming more frequent as the planned offensive north of Iasi has begun. It is not being conducted with a fictitious number of tanks and later than the original plan prescribed, but nevertheless with fresher and more capable units than usual. It is necessary to capture the high ground between the Prut and Targal Frumos. It is easier to hold and the capture of this section would deprive the enemy of a convenient springboard for attack. The whole front line in this sector is in motion, and we succeed in pushing the Soviets back a considerable distance. Facing stubborn resistance, they manage to hold several key points. 
They are lucky because the local attacks with which we had hoped to wipe out these pockets of resistance never materialized. Some of our attacking units, which are thrown into action like fire brigades where the fiercest fighting is going on, have to be withdrawn. In the course of this offensive I make my 2100th combat sortie. The target is a familiar one, the bridge at Skulany, which is important for supplying the Soviet units under attack. Every time we come in to attack it from Jas, it is already shrouded in an artificial smoke screen and we can never be sure we are not dropping bombs on our own troops. Every time I see that veil I laugh imagining the faces of the Ivans down there, gazing intently into the smoke, waiting for our approach. It doesn't take a linguist to hear one repeated word stuka 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 stuka. Our days in Husi are numbered. In the first half of July, after celebrating my birthday, comes the order to relocate to Zamosk, located in the central sector of the Eastern Front. Here the Russians have launched a new large-scale offensive. We arrive at our new base of operations, flying over the northern Carpathians, Struge and skirting Lviv. Zamosk is a pleasant little town and makes a good impression on us. We are housed in old Polish barracks on the northern outskirts of the town. Our aerodrome is quite far from the town and is just an ordinary field. The runway is very narrow and one day led to an unfortunate incident. During his first landing, non-commissioned officer V. Dot's aeroplane parachutes and the pilot is seriously injured. He is one of my best tank snipers and it will be a long time before we see him again. Here again there is a lot of work for tank fighters, especially when the front line is so fluid. Tank breakthroughs are frequent. We have held Koval, but the Soviets have bypassed it and intend to force the bug. Very little time passes and their shock wedges appear northwest of Elvav at Rora Ruska and Tomazo, and they capture home in the north. During this phase we relocate again this time to Milek, a small Polish town a hundred kilometers northwest of Krakow. The objective of the Soviet offensive is clear they are trying to reach the Vistula on a relatively broad front. Our objective is the approaching masses of men and military equipment trying to cross the sand north of Peremyshal. Enemy opposition in the air should not be underestimated, as American fighters appear with increasing frequency serving as escorts for the four-engine bombers. They initially depart from air bases in the Mediterranean. As we assume, they do not return to their bases after completing the mission, but land on Russian territory to refuel. They then fly again the next day for the mission and fly south to their permanent air bases after the mission is completed. During one of the sorties over the San River, flying a mission, I encounter these Mustangs, out of nearly 300. I am flying with 15 other Stukas without any fighter escort. We are still 30 kilometers from Yaroslav, our objective today. In order not to endanger the squadron and, amongst all others, several crews of new recruits, I give the order to drop the bombs so that we can maneuver better during such an unequal air battle. I reluctantly give this order. So far we have always attacked our assigned target, even in the face of overwhelming enemy superiority. This is the first and last time we're getting rid of bombs in the war. But today I have no choice. So I bring the squadron home without loss, and we find ourselves able to make up for this failure and complete the mission the next day under much more favourable conditions. The success justifies my actions because in the evening I learn that a neighbouring unit has suffered heavy losses from a huge formation of Mustangs. A few days later, while refuelling, we are again taken by surprise by American planes, which immediately descend and start attacking our aircraft. The defence of our airfield is not very strong and our anti-aircraft gunners, caught by surprise, are late in opening fire on the attackers. 
The Americans did not take the anti-aircraft guns into account, and since their plans clearly did not include fighting a resisting enemy, they turn around and go away in search of easier prey. A telephone call from the Luftwaffe headquarters for the first time in this war the Russians have set foot on German soil and are rushing into East Prussia from the area of Volkovisk in the direction of Gumbin in Insterberg. I want to fly to East Prussia immediately. I receive an order for transfer and the next day I arrive in Insterberg together with all the flight personnel. Being in the divine peaceful silence of East Prussia, it is impossible to imagine that the war has already come so close and from this quiet place we'll have to make combat sorties involving bombers and aircraft tank fighters. In Insterberg itself, people had not yet realised the seriousness of the situation. The local aerodrome is still overloaded with facilities that are useless for such mass combat operations. It is therefore best to move to Lotsen in the Missourian Lakes region, where we find ourselves alone on a tiny airfield. Midsummer in the beautiful East Prussian countryside. Is it to become a battlefield? It is here that we realise we are fighting for our homes and our freedom. How much German blood has already been shed on this land, and all in vain. It must not happen again. These thoughts do not leave us as we fly towards our goals Mimel or Suoliai, Suwaki or Augustuwu. We are back where we started in 1941, right from where the invasion to the east began. Will this majestic monument in Tannenberg take on even greater symbolic significance? The aeroplanes of our squadron carry the emblem of German chivalry. Never has it meant so much to us. Fierce fighting in the area of Volkovisk. The city several times passes from hand to hand. Here holds the defence of a small German armoured unit. We support it from the first to the last ray of light, repelling countless Russian attacks for several days. Some of the T-34s are sheltering behind huge haystacks in the fields from which the harvest has already been removed. We set fire to the stacks with incendiary bullets to deny them cover, then attack the tanks. The summer is hot, we are stationed by the water, and often bathe in the short half-hour intervals between sorties, a real treat. Soon the effects of these battles on the ground, and our sorties begin to be felt the initial fury of the Russian attacks is noticeably lessened. Counterattacks occur more and more frequently, and the front stabilises again to a certain extent. But when fighting subsides in one place, you can be sure that it will flare up somewhere else. The Soviets are rushing into Lithuania, trying to outflank our armies in Estonia and Latvia. Consequently, there is always plenty of work for us in the air. The Soviets are relatively well aware of the strength of our defences on the ground and in the air. One of the sorties gives Lieutenant Fickle a reason to celebrate his birthday again. We fly out to attack a concentration of enemy forces, and the Reds once again use their old trick of making radio transmissions on our frequencies. Personally, at that moment I can't understand what they're gibbering about, but it's obviously referring to us because they keep repeating the word Stuka. My linguist colleague and the ground post, which has an interpreter, Tell me the whole story afterwards. Here's what roughly is going on. The Stukas are approaching from the west I call all red falcons immediately attack the Stukas. There are about twenty of them in front, is a single Stuka with two long stripes, this is in all probability Rudel's squadron. The same one that always puts our tanks out of action. Calling all Red Falcons and anti aircraft gunners shoot down the Stuka with the long stripes. Lieutenant Marquardt is right in the air making a brief translation, Fickle says with a laugh. If they're aiming at the lead man, you can bet they'll hit the wingman. He usually flies my wingman, and so he knows what he's talking about ahead and below us on the road, running between two wooded areas the Ivans are moving with their vehicles, artillery and other equipment. Heavy anti-aircraft fire, 
The Red Falcons are already here. We are being attacked by Aerocobras. I give the order to start the attack. Most of the planes dive on the trucks, smaller ones on the anti-aircraft batteries, maneuvering desperately. The fighters believe now that it is their time. The bursts of anti-aircraft shells are getting closer and closer to our planes. Just before entering the dive, Fickle takes a direct hit in the wing, he drops his bombs and flees in the direction we came from. His plane is engulfed in flames. We've already dropped the bombs and we're coming out of the dive. I gain altitude to see where Fickle has gone. He lands in the centre of a poorly landed area with ditches, holes, stumps and other obstacles. His plane jumps over two ditches like an angry goose. It's a miracle he didn't spar. Here he and his gunner are climbing out of the cockpit. The situation is bad. Enemy cavalrymen, followed by several tanks, are approaching the aircraft from the woods, quite obviously intending to capture the crew. The Aerocobras are attacking us even more fiercely from above. I say, someone must land immediately. You all know I'm not allowed to do that now. I have a terrible feeling because I've been banned from flying and it's not in my nature to disobey orders. We are still circling over the downed aircraft, fickle and barch down there, in all probability unable to imagine that anyone could land unharmed under such circumstances. The Soviets gradually come closer, and still no one starts the landing evasive manoeuvres to evade fighter attacks require the full attention of each crew. It is difficult for me to make the decision to land myself, no matter what, but in this situation if I do not act immediately, my comrades will die. If they can still be saved at all, I have the best chance of doing so. I know that disobeying an order is unforgivable, but the determination to save my comrades is stronger than a sense of duty. I have forgotten the consequences of my actions, everything else. I must save them. I give the orders. Seven attack cavalry and infantry from low altitude. Eighth circle at medium altitude to cover me and fickle. Ninth climb higher and engage the fighters. If they dive, attack them from above. I fly very low over the forced landing site and pick out a patch of ground that I can use, if I'm lucky, to land on. Slowly I add throttle. Here we are over the second ditch. Take off the throttle, a horrendous jump, then I stop. Fickle and Barch run towards us like people saving their lives. Here they are already at the plane. The Ivan's bullets haven't hit anyone yet. They both climb into the cockpit. I give the throttle. I'm shaking with tension. Will I be able to take off? Will my plane rise into the air before it hits some obstacle on the ground and blows to pieces? There's the ditch. I lift off the ground, fly over the ditch, wheels touching the ground again. Then the plane levels off. Slowly the tension subsides. The squadron approaches us, and we return home without loss. Rudel's wandering circus is stationed in a harvested field near the town of Wenden, close to the Latvian-Estonian border. Field Marshal Shauna kept trying to get my squadron in his sector, and finally succeeded. We found ourselves on the Kurland front. No sooner had we settled on our field when the inevitable cake appeared along with a greeting from the Field Marshal. No matter where I come under his command, one of these fabulous cakes always appears, usually with a T-34 in sugar icing along with the number of tanks I have destroyed so far. Right now the cake is decorated with the number 320. The general situation here is as follows in the area of Tukum we conducted an offensive in order to restore the broken link with the rest of the Eastern Front. The strike was carried out by an assault group under the command of Colonel Count Strakwitz and was successful. Nevertheless, the Soviets are making stubborn efforts to break through our defences in eastern Courland. This sector has long been a real thorn in their side. So far it has held out thanks to the bravery of our German soldiers, 
in spite of the enormous material superiority of the Soviets. At the moment, this sector is again under unusually heavy pressure. The field marshal has called us to help precisely to relieve this enemy pressure. During our first sorties, we see that the front line here is relatively stable. The red positions are everywhere well fortified. Their camouflage is excellent. Their anti-aircraft batteries are close to the front line and everywhere strong enough. Enemy activity in the air is lively and does not cease for an hour. There are hordes of enemy fighters circling there and only a few of our aeroplanes because it is so difficult to get supplies into the cauldron. Stocks of petrol, bonds and equipment must be available whenever they are needed and require a lot of storage space. The bread we eat here is earned by hard work, no matter in which direction we fly, east or south of the cauldron, on the Tukum front, or where the main Russian strike is directed through Dorpat to Tallinn. In several sorties we were lucky and managed to destroy a large motorized convoy, including escort tanks, which reached Derpt. This breakthrough was stopped and the front was completely closed by the army forces. Where did they get these incalculable masses of men and fighting equipment from? There is obviously something supernatural about it. Most of the trucks we shell are usually of American origin. Only occasionally there are small groups of Shermans moving among the tanks we run into. The Russians don't even need these American tanks because their own are better adapted to combat conditions in Russia and they are produced in fabulous quantities. This vast amount of military equipment and supplies leaves us confused and often discouraged. We often encounter American-made aircraft, especially Aerocobras, King Cobras and Bostons. The Americans supply their ally with motor vehicles in incredible quantities, but also with aeroplanes. Is it really in their own interest to help the Russians on this scale? We often argue about this. One day at half past three in the morning, I am awakened by Lieutenant Weisbach, my intelligence officer. Field Marshal Shauna wants to speak to me urgently. For a long time at night, I switch off my telephone because I make my first sorties very early and must be well rested. So my intelligence officer, who is not due to fly the next morning, takes all the night calls, but for the field marshal I am always on. He doesn't beat around the bush, it's not his style. Can you fly out immediately? Up to 40 tanks and motorized infantry have broken through. Our frontline units were unable to stop the breakthrough and want to close the gap again this evening. But these Russians have already advanced far and need to be attacked to prevent them from expanding the breakthrough area. If they succeed in doing that, they could do a lot of damage to our rear supply lines, it's the same old story. I've been in the Shkorna sector too long to wonder much longer. Our brothers in arms at the front have laid low and let the tanks over them, and now expect us to carry chestnuts out of the fire for them. They have left us the honour of dealing with the enemy forces in their rear, hoping that they can close the gap that very evening or in a couple of days by disarming the encircled enemy forces. Here in Courland, this is particularly important because any enemy breakthrough could lead to the disintegration of the entire front. After a brief analysis of the situation, I tell Field Marshal in the dark the sortie will have no success. Because I need daylight to attack tanks and trucks from low altitude. I promise to take to the air at dawn with the entire third squadron and an anti-tank link to attack the place on the map that you indicate to me. I will then contact you immediately and let you know what the situation looks like according to what he told me. The Reds have penetrated the Lake District, and at the moment, with all their shock-armoured formations are on the road running between the two lakes. In the meantime, I instruct Lieutenant Weisbach to use the telephone to gather weather reports from all possible sources and wake us up, so that we could take off in the pre-dawn twilight and appear over the target at first light. A quick phone call to the squad leaders, 
and it's all automatic from there. What you've practiced hundreds of times, you can do in your sleep. The cook knows exactly when to serve coffee. The chief mechanic knows to the second when to build ground staff and start preparing for departure. All I have to do is tell the squadrons. First flight at 0530. Early in the morning there is a thick fog over the aerodrome. Due to the urgency of this task and hoping that visibility will be better in the target area, we take off. At low altitude we are heading southeast. Fortunately the terrain below is flat as a board, otherwise the flight would be impossible. Visibility is just over 400 meters, especially when it's not quite light yet. We have been flying for about half an hour when the fog descends to the ground because we are approaching the Lake District. Because of the difficulty of flying at 50 to 60 meters, I give the order to regroup. For safety reasons, we line up in a single row. Neighboring aircraft are moving in the ground layer of fog and from time to time disappear from sight. Under these weather conditions, we will not be able to attack successfully. If we have to drop bombs because of the low altitude, the flying debris may damage our own machines. Just staying in the target area didn't help anyone. I'm glad when the last of us lands safely. I inform Field Marshal Shauna of everything, and he tells me that he has received the same weather reports from the front line. Finally, close to nine o'clock in the morning, the layer of fog over the airfield spreads a little and rises to a height of 400 meters. I fly out together with the anti-tank link, accompanied by the seventh link, which should bomb targets. Under the very layer of fog, we again go to the southeast. But the further we fly in this direction, the lower the lower edge falls. Soon we are again forced to descend to a height of 50 meters. Visibility is extremely poor. There are almost no landmarks on the terrain, and so I fly by compass. The Lake District begins and the weather remains abysmal. I am approaching from the northeast the point that Field Marshal gave me as the location of the shock wedges. I make a slight detour to the west and fly past the target, so that after the approach I continue to fly in a straight line towards home, a much needed precaution in this weather. If the enemy is as strong as we have been described, he is most likely protected by adequate anti-aircraft fire. We cannot approach the target cautiously under cover of hills or trees, because we are entering the attack over water. Accordingly, in the choice of tactics, anti-aircraft fire must be taken into consideration. Staying out of sight of anti-aircraft gunners, then coming out of the clouds and hiding in them, is not advisable for the whole formation because of the danger of collisions so close to the ground, although it is possible for a single aircraft. The pilots will have to pay attention solely to the flight itself and will not be able to concentrate enough on their task. We are flying low over the water, coming in from the south. The weather is overcast. I can't distinguish anything further than 700 to 800 meters. Now directly ahead I see a dark moving mass of road, tanks, lorries, Russians. I immediately shout attack immediately, almost at point blank range. The defense opens fire directly at my car, twin and quad counter machine guns, automatic rifles are firing, everything is brightly lit by flashes. I'm flying at a height of 30 meters and run into the middle of a hornet's nest. Isn't it time to get out of here? Other planes fan out on either side of me and the defenses don't pay them the same attention. I spin and toss the machine from side to side, performing the craziest defensive maneuvers to avoid being hit. I shoot without aiming because trying to level the machine for a more accurate aim would mean certain death. When I reach the tanks and vehicles I gain a little altitude and fly right over them. I wait every second for a hit. This is all going to end badly. My head is as hot as the metal screeching past. A few seconds later there is a loud bang. 
Gadaman shouts the engines on fire. A hit to the engine. I can see that the engine is not giving the right revs. Flames are licking the cockpit. Ernest, let's jump. I'll gain a little altitude and fly as far as I can to get out of the way of the Russians. I saw our guys not far away. I try to climb higher. I have no idea of our altitude. Dark oil on the cockpit blazing. I can't see anything else and drop the lantern to see something. But that doesn't help either. Flames cover everything around me. Ernest, let's jump right now. The engine stutters and crackles, stops, runs again, stops, runs. Our plane will become our crematorium in that meadow over there. We've got to jump. We can't shout Skaderman. It's only 30 metres high he can see better from behind. He drops his torch too, cutting the intercom wire. We can no longer speak to each other. His last words were over the forest. I pull on the handle as hard as I can, but the plane refuses to climb up. Gaderman says we're flying too low to parachute. Can we land? Probably yes, even though I can't see anything. For that the engine must be running, albeit erratically. I'm slowly taking off the throttle. When I feel the plane begin to slump, I cast my eyes around. I see the ground whizzing by. We are now only six or seven metres high. I tense my muscles in case of impact. Suddenly we touch the ground and I switch off the ignition. The engine stops. Maybe we're finished. Then something rumbles and I don't remember anything else. I feel something around me, so I'm still alive. I try to remember I'm lying on the ground. I want to get up, but I can't. I'm pinned to the ground, pain in my leg and head. Then I realize that Gaderman must be somewhere. I call out to him, Ernest, where are you? I can't get up. Wait a little while, maybe it will work out it hurts a lot. A little time passes before he, limping, walks over to me and tries to pull me out of the wreckage. I realize now why I'm in so much pain a long piece of metal from the tail of the plane has pierced my lower thigh and the entire tailplane is lying right on top of me, so I can't move. Where are the burning pieces? The first thing Gaderman does is pull a piece of metal out of my leg, then he extracts me from under the tail debris. He has to strain all his strength to lift them. I ask. Do you think the Russians are here yet yet? Hard to say. We are surrounded by woods and bushes. As soon as I get to my feet, I look around at the scene of the crash. About 30 meters away from us lies the engine. It's still on fire. 10 meters away lies the wings, one of them also smoking. Directly in front of me, at a decent distance, lies a part of the fuselage with the seat of the flight gunner in which Gaderman was jammed. That's why his voice was heard from the front when I called out to him. It usually comes from behind because he's sitting behind me. We dress our wounds and try to figure out why we are still alive and in relative safety, because without proper dressing I can't expect to be saved. Too much blood has been lost. Our fall from a 30-meter height went in what seems to have been the following sequence. The main impact was softened by the trees at the edge of the forest. Then the plane hit a strip of sandy soil where it broke apart, and its various parts flew apart, as I have already described. Both of us were not strapped in as we were preparing to parachute. I still can't understand why I didn't hit my head on the dashboard. I was lying far away from the remains of the pilot's seat. I must have been thrown here along with the tail. Yeah, you're not born beautiful, you're born happy. Suddenly a crackling sound is heard in the bushes someone is making his way through the undergrowth. We look in the direction of the sound with bated breath, then exhale with relief. We recognize the German uniforms. They have heard the rumble of a fall from the road. And before that, distant gunfire and a burning German aeroplane. They rush us. 
there is no one behind us. Only hordes of Ivans, one of them adds with a chuckle, but I think you spotted the Ivans yourself and points with his eyes to the smoking wreckage of the aircraft. We climb into the lorry they were travelling in and head northwest. In the afternoon we arrive at the squadron's location. No one saw our crash because everyone was busy at that moment. The first four hours of our absence did not cause much concern as I, as a result of enemy action, was often forced to land my plucky U87 on its belly not far from the front line and then report my whereabouts by telephone. Nevertheless, as more than four hours passed, people's faces darkened and faith in my proverbial infallible guardian angel began to wane. I got through to the field marshal. He was more pleased than anyone that I had returned from the other side of the world and need hardly be told that he had warned me of the imminent arrival of another birthday cake. The sky is bright blue and the last signs of fog have disappeared. I report to the field marshal that we are flying out again. I am particularly ill-disposed against our Soviet friends. It's them or me that's the law of war. This time it wasn't me, hence it was their turn. The regiment sent its medic to Storch. He bandages my wounds and announces that I've got concussion. Gaderman has broken three ribs. I can't say I feel great, but my determination to fly outweighs all other considerations. I'm briefing the crews, assigning them targets. We will attack the anti-aircraft guns with all bomber planes, and when they are neutralized, we will destroy trucks and tanks during low-altitude attacks. My squadron quickly takes to the air and heads southeast. We are flying at an altitude of 2,200 meters, so we will be able to come in from the side of the sun. The anti-aircraft gunners will hardly see us, and we can more accurately drop bombs on their guns if they glint in the sun. There they are, still in the same place as before. Apparently they're not going to move on until reinforcements arrive, some of the anti-aircraft guns are mounted on lorries. The rest are placed in circular fortifications around the vehicles. Once the fireworks begin, I quickly memorize the targets and then follow my own plan of attack, starting with the anti-aircraft guns. I find a special satisfaction in this, as I owe them for the fact that a few hours ago my life hung in the balance. We in anti-tank aeroplanes fly through the smoke and dust clouds created by the bomb explosions and attack the T-34s. We have to be careful at all times not to be near an exploding bomb. Anti-aircraft guns are soon suppressed. One tank after another explodes, the lorries catch fire. They never make it to Germany. This armoured wedge has definitely lost its impetuosity. We return home with the feeling that we have done our best. In the evening the field marshal calls us again and tells us that our comrades on the ground have carried out a successful counterattack. The breach has been closed and the encircled enemy destroyed. He thanks us on behalf of the command for our support. Tomorrow morning I will have to relay his message to the whole squadron. Our greatest reward is to hear from our comrades in arms that their cooperation with us proved indispensable and contributed to their success. In Latvia, we receive disturbing rumours that the Soviets have invaded Romania. We are immediately transferred to Buzau. North of Bucharest, our route from East Prussia is via Krakow and Debrecen a marvellous flight across Eastern Europe in the sunshine of Indian summer. The flight is made by the 3rd Squadron and Regimental Headquarters, the 2nd Squadron is in the Warsaw area, and the 1st Squadron is already in Romania. At Debrecen a lot of time is spent refueling, and it is too late to fly on to Romania. We have to cross the Carpathians and I am not going to lose crews during the flight, so we stay overnight in Debrecen, and in the evening I suggest we all go for a swim. There are marvellous baths in the town with water from warm healing springs. 
we find here, to the delight and pleasure of my companions, women of all ages sitting phlegmatically in the water with their handbags, books and embroidery. Their water procedures are accompanied by endless female gossip, and this is what they do for most of the day. To the veterans of the Russian company, the sight of these women in bathing costumes presents a very outlandish spectacle. Next morning we fly to Klausenberg, a beautiful old town where the Transylvanian Germans lived centuries ago, which is why the locals speak German. We are in a big hurry and stop here only for refueling. At this time an American spy plane appears at an altitude of 7,000 meters. This means that the visit of American bombers will not have to wait too long. The flight over the Carpathians to Buzau leaves an unforgettable impression, as well as any flight over a beautiful mountain landscape in perfect weather. A town appears ahead. The local airfield used to be used as an intermediate stop on the way to the front far to the north. Now it is an operating base almost at the very front line. What happened to the stable front line along the ISE Targal Frumos line and on to Husi? The aerodrome is in the middle of open terrain and it is difficult to camouflage our aircraft. Very close is Plasti, the oil heart of Romania. It is incessantly attacked by American bombers under very strong defense by fighter planes. After the bombing, the fighters may turn their attention to us as well, if only they think we are worth it. The number of American fighters that are sent to escort the bombers during each sortie is greater than the total number of German fighters on the entire front. When I come in for a landing, I see that all the roads leading to the aerodrome are jammed with endless streams of Romanian soldiers striving southwards in places columns frozen in traffic jams, among them heavy artillery of all calibres. But there are no German units here. I find myself witnessing the last act of the tragedy. Whole sectors on the front line have been abandoned by Romanian units which have ceased to offer any resistance and are now retreating all along the front. The Soviets are pursuing them on their heels. Where the Romanians are retreating, the German soldiers are fighting to the last man, so they will be cut off and taken prisoner. They think that our Romanian allies will never allow the Soviets to invade Romania without a fight and will abandon their people to their fate. They simply refuse to believe it. After landing, our planes immediately begin to prepare for departure. I report the arrival to the regimental headquarters. They are glad that we are back and will fight with them. They believe that we will have a lot to do. Russian tanks are already in Foscari. Their goal is to quickly capture Bucharest and Plesti. Further north, German troops from Army Group South are still fighting. Meanwhile, our planes are ready to take off, and we immediately take off, gain altitude and go over the main road going north to Voskari. Ten kilometers south of this town we see giant clouds of dust. Yes, those are Russian tanks. We attack, they pull off the road and scatter across the fields. But that doesn't save them. We shoot some of them, then return to replenish ammunition and continue our fight with the same column. Everywhere you look there are masses of men and military equipment, mostly Mongols. Are their manpower reserves so inexhaustible? We get a fresh clear proof that the productive capacity of the USSR was greatly underestimated by everyone and no one knows the true state of affairs. Masses of tanks, again and again in unimaginable quantities, are the most convincing proof of this. Many vehicles of American manufacture one hour attack follows another, from sunrise to sunset, as it has been all these years. One of the last days of August. I take off early in the morning to go to the area north of us where the Reds have broken through and climb to an altitude of 50 metres above the airfield. Suddenly our anti-aircraft guns open fire. They are being manned by Romanian squads who are supposed to be defending our airfield from attacks by Russian and American aircraft. 
I look over to where the shells are exploding and scour the sky for enemy bombers. Did the Americans really get up so early this morning? I, along with the other planes, make a U-turn over the runway to wait under protection as events unfold further. But the shells are flying lower and some are bursting in unpleasant proximity to my aircraft. I look down at the firing batteries and see that the barrels of the anti-aircraft guns are turning to follow our manoeuvres. One of the shells bursts very close. No enemy aeroplanes in sight. There is no more doubt these anti-aircraft guns are firing at our planes. I can't explain it in any way, but the fact remains. We are flying north against the advancing Soviets, who are tearing southwards from the husi barlad foscari area in large forces. During our return to the aerodrome, I am prepared for more absurd antics by the Romanian anti-aircraft gunners, ground control having already informed me on the way back that the guns were aimed precisely at me. As of today, the Romanians are at war with us. We immediately descend to low altitude and land one by one. The individual Romanian guns open fire on us again, but as before, with no success. I immediately head for the telephone and connect with Romanian General Ionescu. He commands the entire Romanian Air Force as well as the anti-aircraft batteries, and I know him well personally from Husi. He has several German decorations. I tell him that the unfriendly attention this morning was addressed to me and my squadron and ask him if this is true. He does not deny it and says that his anti-aircraft gunners saw a German fighter shoot down a Romanian liaison aircraft and that accordingly they are greatly enraged and fire at all German aircraft that come within their sight. He has not yet once mentioned the state of war existing between Germany and Russia. I reply to his complaints that I have not the slightest intention of listening to all this nonsense and that I was about to make a new combat sortie against the Russians north of Ramical Sarat. However, now I, with the help of my Stukas, intend first to bomb and machine gun all the anti-aircraft batteries around our aerodrome to eliminate any interference with our sorties. Then, with the help of another squadron, we will attack his headquarters. I know exactly where it is. For God's sake, don't do that. We have always been the best of friends and I cannot be held responsible for the actions of our government. I make you an offer. Neither we nor you will do anything about it and pay no attention to the declaration of war as if it did not exist. I give you my personal guarantees that as long as I remain in command, not a single shot will be fired at your stukas. He swears by our old friendship with him in particular and by his warm feelings for us Germans in general. After this separate peace has been declared between us, I have no further cause for complaint. It is a curious situation I am here alone with my flying staff on this aerodrome in a country which is at war with us. Two Romanian divisions with all their equipment, including heavy artillery, have surrounded our aerodrome. Who will prevent them from liquidating us immediately? During the night hours we do not feel very cosy, during the day we are strong again. Even the two divisions are not very ready to be aggressive towards my Stukas when they are so heavily concentrated and in the open. Our stock of bombs and fuel at the aerodrome is running low and no new supplies are coming to us as Romania can no longer be held. Our only chance is to move to the other side of the Carpathians and try to form a new front here from the remnants of those of our armies which have managed to break through from Romania and any other units which we can scrape together from the reserves. It is quite clear that our heavy artillery will never be able to overcome the Carpathians and will have to be abandoned in Romania. If only the bulk of our brave army could get out of this diabolical cauldron of treason, for which the Romanian government is to be blamed. Weapons can be replaced, difficult as it may be, but men can never be replaced. Our ground personnel are preparing to hit the road leading over the Bazao Pass, 
We are using the last drops of fuel attacking the Russian wedges that are coming closer and closer to Bazal. Often we make sorties deep into the Russian positions to relieve the German troops still engaged in fierce fighting here. What a sad sight, enough to drive anyone to despair, to see these veterans of the Russian company, surrounded by the enemy, thrashing against the approaching wall of a numerically superior enemy until they have nothing to fight with but their personal weapons. The artillery has long since fired all their shells, soon they will not even have rifle or revolver cartridges left. The only way to drag out their resistance is to attack and attack again. Now our supplies at the airfield are finally depleted, and we are flying west over the Carpathian Mountains to our new base of operations at Soxis region in Hungary. In this town almost everyone speaks German, it is the citadel of the Transylvanian Germans. There's a German church and a German school over there, and when you walk through the town, you don't even think about the fact that you're not in Germany. The town is picturesquely spread out between chains of hills and small mountains, and there are many forests in the neighborhood. Our airfield is on high ground and surrounded by forests, and we are quartered in the town itself, and in the neighboring purely German villages to the north and northeast of it. Our operations at the moment are directed against the enemy tearing from the east across the Carpathians. There are many excellent defensive positions here, but we do not have sufficient forces to hold them, as all heavy artillery has been lost in Romania. Even the most favourable terrain cannot be defended against the most modern weapons by heroism alone. We make attacks from low altitudes on mountain passes and the roads leading to them. I have experience of flying in the Caucasus Mountains, but here the valleys are very narrow, especially in the lower part, and before you could turn round, you have to climb to a considerable height. The roads on the passes are winding and large sections of them run along notches cut into the rocky mountain slopes. Since cars and tanks are usually protected by rocks, you have to be devilishly careful not to crash into them here and there. If another group of aeroplanes flies over in the same area, and at the same time, perhaps coming in on target from the other side of the valley and belatedly sees us through the haze, then for a split second death grasps the control stick with a bony hand, when one group meets another flying towards it. This is an even greater danger than the anti-aircraft guns, which must by no means be discountenanced. Some of them are stationed on mountain slopes, to the right and left of the roads through the passes. The enemy has realized that leaving anti-aircraft guns as part of convoys on the road is relatively ineffective when we are, for example, attacking targets below from behind a group of rocks. There are few fighters so far. Are the Russians taking so long to relocate to Romanian airfields? I doubt it, because they have no supply problems and the existing airfields at Buzau, Roman, Tekukachi, Bakau and Silistria are perfectly located and quite adequate for the battle. Presumably the Ivans are not very fond of flying in the mountains. They are especially wary of flying at low altitude in valleys because of the possibility of unexpectedly hitting a dead end, the exit of which is blocked by sharply rising mountains. I had exactly the same feeling two years ago when we were flying over passes and valleys in the Caucasus Mountains. At this time I receive orders to take command of the regiment and surrender my third squadron. As my successor the name of Oberleutnant Lau, he had served with distinction in the squadron since Greece. After the first phase of the Russian company he was posted to staff work and has now returned to the front again. As far as my own flying is concerned, this change does not affect me in any way. I have at my disposal for flying all the types of aeroplanes in service with the regiment and can fly with one unit or another at any time. One day in early September I take off early in the morning with my third squadron. The second squadron accompanies us as an escort, 
I myself, together with a squadron of anti-tank aeroplanes, are engaged in hunting tanks in the area of the Oitotsko Pass. The situation there does not seem particularly pleasant. I decide, therefore, immediately after my return to take to the air in an FV-190. Meanwhile, the other pilots' aircraft are being serviced before the next flight. Lieutenant Hofmeister is ready for the flight and will accompany me as a scout. We return to Oitotsu, conduct several attacks from low altitudes and reconnoitre the state of affairs at all Carpathian passes and altitudes, from which we get an overall picture of the situation in our sector. I am returning, literally without a drop of petrol, and without a single cartridge to our flying field, when I see forty silver planes coming towards me at the same altitude. We're passing very close to each other. There's no more hiding. They're American Mustangs. I say to Hofmeister, land now, I release the landing gear, flaps and go down before the Mustangs can turn and attack. Gliding towards the ground takes a lot of nerve because it's that moment when your aircraft is completely defenceless and there's nothing you can do but wait patiently for it to stop. I'm still rolling on the ground when I look back and see the Mustangs launching an attack and one of them coming straight at my plane. I hastily flip the lantern off I'm still travelling at 50 kilometres an hour, climb out on the wing and throw myself to the ground just seconds before the Mustang's guns start barking. My plane, which has rolled away on its own already quite far away, catches fire after the first attack. I'm pleased I managed to get out of it in time. We have no anti-aircraft guns at our aerodrome because no one expected or was prepared for our retreat to the Hungarian aerodromes. Our enemies who have unlimited resources can place anti-aircraft batteries on every corner. We unfortunately cannot afford it. The Mustangs are scattered over the whole aerodrome and are quietly engaged in target practice as in peacetime. My squadron, which should have been refueled and supplied with ammunition, is still on the ground. Several transport planes that delivered ammunition, fuel and bombs to us are standing in the open. The airworthy aircraft are in improvised hangars in the woods and are difficult to get into. But repairable planes and transports with bombs and fuel are blowing up, the guns of forty Mustangs rumbling without respite, turning everything the pilots see into flames and debris. I am overcome with helpless rage, having to look at it all and not being able to respond. The aeroplanes are burning under the whole aerodrome, and clouds of black smoke are rising above them. In this turmoil, one would think that the end of the world has come. As absurd as it sounds, I try to sleep for a moment. By the time I wake up, it will all be over. If that guy who keeps circling above me can hit me, I'll have an easier time accepting it if I fall asleep. After the Mustang pilot set my plane on fire during the first attack, he must have noticed me lying in the field. Perhaps he actually saw me jump off the wing. Either way, he comes back again and again and tries to hit me with cannons and machine guns. Apparently, he can't see me clearly through the scope. He must not be able to believe he hasn't hit me yet because after coming in once or twice he comes roaring over me, drops to a height of a few metres and looks at me. I lie on my stomach without moving, only turning my head slightly to glare at him from under half-lidded eyelids. Every time he approaches me from the front, sand from bullet fountains falls on me. Will he hit me next time? You can't run, they shoot at anything that moves. And so it goes on, ad infinitum. At last he, as I am quite sure, runs out of ammunition, passing over me once more he flies away. His colleagues have also used up their ammunition, very cleverly, I must admit. They line up over the airfield and fly away. Our aerodrome is a terrible sight, particularly at first glance. The first thing I look for is Lieutenant Hofmeister. His aeroplane is lying on the edge of the airfield. He must have failed to land quickly and been caught while landing. 
He is injured, one leg will have to be amputated. There are planes burning and exploding on the airfield, fortunately only a few combat-ready machines among them, which were well camouflaged and were not such an easy target. As I visit each unit in the woods, I am told that during the attack the ground personnel, as they were ordered to do, took continuous small arms fire. Four Mustangs were shot down. Considering we had no anti-aircraft guns, this is particularly encouraging. So the Mustangs didn't get their safe target practice fire. The anti-aircraft guns arrive in a few days and it's unlikely that the same successful raids will ever happen again. German aeroplanes piloted by Romanians, whom we ourselves have supplied with them, are frequently encountered in our sector. They are now wearing Romanian identification marks and flying on the Russian side. The Romanian base of operations is not very far from ours, so we are conducting two low-altitude attacks on their airfields in the area of Karlsberg, Kronstadt and Hermannstadt. Evil tongues suggest we're trying to imitate the Mustangs, who did the same thing. We destroy more than 150 aircraft on the ground, some of them in the air. They are mostly training and liaison aircraft, but in this case they are also used by the Romanian Air Force, even if for training. The success of these attacks depends very much on the strength of the enemy defences. The fighting in Romania has come to an end. Soviet flooding has swamped the whole country, and now they are trying to find passages into Hungary. Russian columns one after another are marching over the rather term pass towards Hermannstadt. Sorties against these are particularly difficult because their armies are very heavily defended against air attack. During one of the flights over the northern slopes of the pass, a 40mm anti-aircraft shell blows off my lantern. Fortunately, none of the shrapnel hits me. That same evening, my intelligence officer says that he hears propaganda programs in German on the radio almost every day. These are stories of German soldier atrocities and incitement to guerrilla warfare. The program always begins with the words Kronstadt speaking. After talking to the group, we schedule the first attack on the radio station for tomorrow so we can deal with these provocateurs. At dawn, we take off in the direction of Kronstadt, an old settlement of Transylvanian Saxons. Just ahead, in the morning mist, the town appears. We don't have to fly over it, the transmission station with its two tall masts stands on the main road seven kilometres to the northeast. Between the giant masts is a small building, the nerve centre of the entire transmitting station. As I fly closer and am about to dive, I see a car pulling out of the courtyard of this building. If I had been sure that its occupants were the ones who incited the guerrillas to stab us in the back, I could have easily covered them during the attack. The car disappears into the woods and the passengers watch our radio attack from afar. During the attack you have to be very careful not to dive too low, because the masts are connected to each other with many cables that are easy to get caught on. A small building is right in the centre of my sight. I press the button, come out of dive and circle around the masts, waiting to see the result while my squadron is back in formation. Coincidentally, one of my little 10 kilograms bombs hit the top of a mast, which broke and bent at right angles. There was nothing left of the radio building. The bombs had done their job. Now they would not be able to broadcast their evil propaganda programs from here for a long time. With this comforting thought, we return to base. The increasing pressure on the Carpathian Parsis shows more and more clearly the extent of the damage to our military power caused by the Romanian fiasco. The Soviets have advanced far beyond Hermannstadt. They are almost at Torenberg and are trying to capture Klausenberg. Most of the troops in this sector are Hungarian, mostly parts of the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions. There are virtually no German reserves to form a backbone of resistance in this important sector. This Soviet offensive endangers the German forces holding the Carpathians further north. 
They have to abandon their positions on the passes with serious consequences, because the Carpathians, being a natural fortress, are the key to the Hungarian plains, which will be very difficult to hold with our diminished forces. For the last few weeks it has been easy for the Soviets to do their job because they have been advancing on allied Romania, in which serious German resistance could not be organized. Our motto away from Romania, the next stop is the Carpathians. But Romania has a long border, and this means that our poorly defended front will have to stretch even further. We return for a few days to our old airfield west of Soxic region, from where we make almost daily sorties to the Torenberg area. For the first time in God knows how long, the Iron Gustavs go into action. During each sortie we stay in the target area as long as our fuel supply allows us, always hoping to encounter the enemy. The third squadron is engaged in bombing. It is escorted by the second squadron, the headquarters wing and myself in an FV-190. During this phase we manage to shoot down a large number of Russian attack aircraft and fighters, especially the commander of the second squadron, Oberlutnant Kennel, who was awarded the oak leaves, succeeds in the hunt. It is no business for dive bombers to shoot down enemy aircraft, but during the present crisis it seems to me very important to our fighting comrades on the ground that we can successfully defeat enemy aircraft. That is why our anti-tank snipers also engage aircraft and achieve excellent results. These operations show us old U87 pilots that it is better to be a hound than a hare. Nevertheless, we are still loyal to our old machines. In September 1944, the battle for the plains of Hungary becomes a reality. At this moment, the news reaches me that I have been promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. The headquarters link and ground staff are briefly stationed at Taznad, south of Tokaj. First and second squadrons and myself are southeast of Taznad. Third squadron is moving to the Miskolc area, where their sorties are hampered by a poor airfield. The whole surrounding area, including the roads leading to the aerodrome, having been turned into swamps by the heavy rains. We are standing here for a short time, only to assist our troops in the fighting going on in the Grossfardin segel debrisen area. The Russian hordes are moving eastwards, almost exclusively at night. During the day they remain in place, well camouflaged in forests beside roads, in cornfields, or in villages. Bombing and air attacks become less important than reconnaissance, since the target must be recognized before it becomes possible to inflict serious damage. The German front is not a unified whole, it is for the most part isolated battle groups, hastily created by the amalgamation of units that either fought their way out of Romania or were previously cantoned in Hungary. These units are a motley mix of all branches of the military. At key points are the shock troops infantry regiments with great traditions, SES units, all our old acquaintances and friends with whom we shared all the difficulties of the hard years in Russia. They love and appreciate our Stukas and we have the same feelings towards them. If we know that one of these units is taking up its position directly below us, we can be sure that there will be no unpleasant surprises. We know most of their airborne officers personally, or at least by voice. They point out to us every pockets of resistance, no matter how small, and then we attack it with everything we have. Ground troops attack themselves with lightning speed and sweep everything away. But the numerical superiority of the enemy is so overwhelming that the greatest local successes are but a drop in the ocean. The Russians advance on the left and right of these skirmishes, and we have not enough soldiers to hold them off and a new breakthrough follows, the result of which is that even those troops who hold a strong defence are forced to retreat before their escape routes are cut. This happens time after time until we find ourselves once more on the T's, which must be held as a new line of defence. 
The river is narrow and does not present a serious obstacle in modern warfare. At Shidi, the Russians very soon seize a strong bridgehead, which we cannot destroy, and from it the enemy strikes rapidly northwestwards towards Keks Gimit. My regiment is pulled back. We are standing at Farmers, west of Zolnok, on the Zolnok Budapest railway line. Our airfield is frequently visited by four engined American bombers, who had previously concentrated their attention on the railway bridge at Zolnok. We don't complain about our rations here, as Nieman has been given permission to hunt, and the neighborhood is teeming with hares. Every day he returns with a big sack. Friedolin is already sickened by the mere sight of hares. Sometimes there is a sharp chill in the air, winter is coming. Walking around the neighborhood of Farmos in the evening, I succumb to the charm of the valleys to an extent I did not think possible for a mountaineer like me. We fly mainly in the neighborhood of the Tissa, on either side, as the Soviets have succeeded in establishing bridgeheads in several places on the West Bank. Our objectives, as in the past, are concentrations of equipment on the banks of the river and on the roads leading to the bridgeheads in addition to the constantly rebuilt bridges and crossings, which are organized by very primitive methods. Rafts, old sailing vessels, fishing boats and pleasure boats all ply the narrow Ts. Ivan wastes no time in assembling this heterogeneous flotilla. The busiest crossings are between Sieged and Zolnok, later they appear to the north as well. The establishment of many bridgeheads is always a warning that the Soviets are building up the reserves needed for a fresh offensive. Our own successful offensive is underway in the Zolnok Mezatur Kizualis Turkey area, the purpose of which is to upset their preparations. We are flying incessantly in support of our attacks. The new Russian offensive on the Tis is delayed and weakened by this break in communications, at least in the northern sector but they find themselves able to continue to expand the large bridgehead at Sieged and connect it with smaller bridgeheads to the north. At the end of October, an offensive is launched across this entire sector, first following a strike to the northwest and north towards Keck Skimmit. Its aim is clear to cause the collapse of our defence line on the TC and to rush forward across the plains towards Budapest and the Danube, Ivan is very active in the air. It turns out that he has occupied a number of airfields in the vicinity of Debrecen, and we are again engaged in battle with a numerically superior enemy. We are weakened by the loss of a number of aeroplanes shot down by anti-aircraft guns, as well as by poorly received supplies and new resupply, which leaves much to be desired. The Soviets cannot take credit for our predicament, they can only thank their Western allies who have seriously disrupted our communications with four-engine bomber attacks on towns and railway stations. The patrolling of railway lines and roads by American fighter bombers completes the rest. Because of the shortage of men and equipment, we lack the means to defend our transport routes. With the few remaining aircraft of my regiment, including anti-tank aircraft, I often fly combat sorties southeast of Kekskemet. The number of combat-ready aircraft is so badly reduced, for reasons I have already mentioned, that one day I fly out alone, accompanied by four FV-190s to attack enemy tanks in the area. As I approach the target, I can hardly believe my eyes at a great distance. North of Kekskemet on the road are moving tanks. It's the Russians. Above them, like a bunch of grapes, hangs a thick umbrella of Soviet fighters, covering this strike group. One of the officers accompanying me knows Russian and immediately translates to me everything he can make out. The Soviets are again using our frequency for their negotiations. They are shouting at each other and making such a terrible noise that it would be a miracle if any of them could understand what is being said to them. My translator in 190 can make out the following. Calling all Red Falcons a single Stuka, 
With two long stripes is about to attack our tanks, we are sure it is that cheeky Nazi who is shooting our tanks, there are several Fokkers with him. Attack this Stuka, not the Fokkers, he must surely be shot down. During all this turmoil, I have long since dropped to the ground and made the attack. One tank on fire. Two FE-190s hovered over me trying to distract a few La-5s. The other two are stuck to me, manoeuvring with me. They are not going to leave me alone, which is bound to happen if they get into an air battle with the Ivans. Twenty or thirty La-5s and Yak-9s are now turning their attention to us. Presumably the air guide who is directing the fighter's actions is somewhere very close to the tanks, because he's yelling like an uncut man, go, go, shoot that bastard down. Can't you see that one tank is already on fire? To me, this is the most obvious confirmation of victory. Every time one of them attacks, I make a sharp U-turn at the very moment he is heading towards me. His speed does not allow him to follow manoeuvres and this knocks off his aim. I then turn round and come in behind him, even though he is quite far away from me. I'm sorry to waste my anti-tank shells. I fire my 37mm guns at him. Of course it would be better to use them later against other tanks. But even if I miss now, the guy who was meant to get my shells for not watching his tail will get a shock when he sees those fireballs flash by right next to him. Once again, one of the ones I fired on shouts, look round, be careful, can't you see? A Nazi is shooting at you. He yells as if he's already been shot down. The other pilot, probably the commander of this unit, says, We have to attack him simultaneously from different directions. Assemble over the village I'm heading to now. We'll discuss what we can do here. Meanwhile, I attack the other tank. So far they have made no attempt to hide, confident that they are safely protected by their fighters. Once again, one tank bursts into flames. The Red Falcons are circling over the village and yelling terribly. They all want to have their say on the best way to shoot down my Ju-87. The aerial gunner on the ground is furious. He threatens. He asks if they see that four tanks are already burning. Here they are back again, and actually attacking from different directions. I am glad that hitting the fifth tank has used up my last shell. For if this game had gone on and on it would have been hard to hope for a happy ending. All this time sweat is streaming down me, although the weather is very cold. Excitement warms me better than any fur jacket. The same is true of my escort. Lieutenants Biermann and Kinada are less afraid of being shot down than of failing in their duty to protect me, however, it is even more likely that the Ivans can say the same about themselves if they could not shoot down the Stuka with stripes as they were ordered to. They could at least take on the Fokers. We head for home, the Ivans follow us for a while, then turn back. For a while longer we hear the grimaces of the ground aviation officer and the Red Falcons, who apologise. It happens that there is nothing in the way of the Russian advance but isolated units hastily sent to the area of the breakthrough. These often consist of anti-aircraft gunners, airfield maintenance personnel and rear army services. We are short of men and equipment, the same old story, over and over again. Individual bravery, individual actions can delay but cannot completely stop the advance of colossal masses of men and enemy equipment. The few strike units we have cannot keep up everywhere at the same time. In spite of everything, our comrades on the ground are fighting with unfathomable bravery. The front along the Tisa can no longer be held. The next line of defence must be the Danube. I am alarmed by the Soviet strike in the extreme south through Funfkirchen towards Kaposhwar. If it proves successful, this new position will again be in danger. Very little time passes and my fears are confirmed. 